one of the things that we do, my, my colleagues, my students and I, we do uh, a lot of work with artificial intelligence, making machines that uh, react and may appear to be intelligent. But what I want to talk today uh, about is uh, a much stronger proposition for the future. That's the proposition of strong AI, that machines will actually be able to think. Now, more than this, I think that um, understanding what we do, although artificial intelligence research has tried to make this happen for decades, understanding what we do here, smart geometry as designers, is going to be key to actually making this happen. And the flip side of that is that this is going to be crucial. If we can make it happen, it's going to be crucial to the future of what we do in design, especially when we're dealing with uncertainty. Now, what I mean by intelligence, there's lots of different ways of recognizing it. One of the tests uh, that's common in AI is known as the Turing test. Alan Turing proposed this in 1950. And it's basically you take a computer and a person, you put them in a room, and you have an interrogator who tries to ask them as many questions as they can to figure out which is which. If they can't tell which one's the computer, which is the person, then the computer must be intelligent. It must be intelligent because it speaks and sounds intelligent. Now, this is a very important test, but it's not really important for the reasons that everyone thinks. What it appears to be is a test about what intelligence seems to be on the surface. If it speaks intelligently, then it must be intelligent. But there are lots of philosophical problems with this. One of the main ones is that if it's a computer, it's running a program, the representations it uses are given by another programmer. They don't intrinsically mean anything to the machine itself. So to be really intelligent, it's got to be able to come up with its own representations based on its interaction with the world, and they have to, to mean something to it, regardless of whatever anyone else says. What everyone else says. Now, the other objection, sorry, there's uh, the other objection is uh, another philosophical one, and that's potentially that any representation you use is not going to be sufficient. So Kurt Gödel in 1930 or 31, uh, this is his incompleteness theorem, which proves that any formal system, uh, mathematics, computer program, whatever it might be, any formal system is fundamentally incomplete or inconsistent. So this raises a real problem if we're trying to use it to represent intelligence in a computer or a, a mathematical system. So how do we get around this? I think the way we get around it is actually very much to do with how we design. And uh, by illustration of this, I'm just going to show one fairly simple project, but I think this encapsulates what we do all the time in design. And this is a project I did a few years ago for Anthony Gormley, a series of body expansion pieces. You can just make out uh, the shape of the body. It's about sculpting the space around the surface of the body. It's very, very complex, thousands of these linear members. Uh, obviously, there's some order here, but uh, it's important to determine what this order is if you're going to sit and weld one of these things for a month. So my job as a computational designer is to figure out the rules, to come up with the algorithm that will enable people to actually set these things out. Now, if you look at how it's built, uh, you've got a surface of the body, you've got a series of open polygons, hexagons, pentagons over the surface, then a series of rods that extend out about 50 centimeters, and then it's capped off on the outside with another set of open polygons. Now, that suggests, possibly to many of you, it suggested to me eventually, after looking at several versions of this, it suggests a very, very clear algorithm, one of uh, surface normals. So you take a, a normal, a perpendicular at every point on the surface and extend it out, and that's what gives you the form. So we take that and we can generate lots of new examples from it, following those directions specifically. When you do so, though, you realize there are problems with this. So particularly between the legs there, you can see, or between the arm and the torso, these things intersect in space, but they don't actually connect. And this isn't really what was desired. There's no way of actually connecting them cleanly. More than this, intuitively, the, uh, the spaces between the legs, between the arm and the torso and so on, should form the same kind of graceful curved surfaces, the same open polygon texture that you see everywhere else. And that just doesn't happen with surface normals. So that's a problem for that particular representation. What we did, of course, was come up with another representation. That's a Voronoi diagram. Now, that's what it looks like in 2D. Probably most of us are familiar with these. But if you do it in 3D, you get a series of cells that extend outward from the points in the body, extend outwards in all directions, and give you the space around the body. But for free, they also give you the hexagons on the surface. They give you the, uh, the same pattern on the outside. And most importantly, they give you those graceful curves where they intersect between all the various members of the body. So this is a very, very elegant solution, a very good, elegant description representation of what's going on. But I show it not because it's a beautiful project, which I think it is, but because of the process we went through to actually get here. 
So we start off, as we often do, with sketch models. From that, we develop a very clear representation. From that, we can make more things, instances out there in the real world. And then from those, we come up with another representation. But the second one is completely different from the first one. And it's this ability that we have, as designers, to take representations and change them constantly, over and over again, that's fundamental to design. Now, I think it's not only fundamental to design, but it's fundamental to all cognition. This is a basic step that's been left out of artificial intelligence, essentially, for half a decade. Computers are very good at going from rules to instances, and this is what we do with parametric modeling all the time, but they haven't been historically very good at going the other way. So this is where the really interesting work is now, I think. And this is what we're doing with machine learning and with neural networks and things like that. So we can actually get the computer to come up with its own representation, may not be a standard boundary representation of geometry, but something that is inherently meaningful to its own neural network to represent geometry. We can do it with structure as well. I've done a lot of work in the past with very small structural optimizations. Rather than going through a full simulation, full optimization process, we can essentially show the computer a series of structures and how they behave, and it develops an intuition of what structure is all about. And then it's able to use that to create new structures that perform the way we want to. Sam Wilkinson's work here is doing essentially the same thing with computational fluid dynamics, which is very complex, developing an intuition for the computer based on the data that it sees in buildings in the real world. Space syntax analysis. We can take a city based on the configuration of streets, and we can predict where people are likely to walk, where they're likely to drive, uh, those kinds of social interactions that might go on, uh, the local neighborhoods, where the neighborhoods we'd actually name, where the local economic activity is, and things like that. We're able to do all of this. But these are properties that we're very good at speaking about explicitly. Now, we can also do the same thing with things that are, are less clear to us. So if you and I are walking through a neighborhood, we might recognize the characteristic style of the buildings, even though we can't necessarily explain all of the things about those buildings that make them recognizable. We'll still be able to say, this building has a character, and I can see the difference from that one. Now, if we try to explain it to each other, we may have different representations of that character, but that's OK. We can do the same thing with a computer as well, not by explicitly stating the features, but by showing it using machine vision and other techniques. These are a set of buildings. Can you tell the difference from these? And then they generally tend to make the same kinds of decisions that we would. We can do this at a much larger scale, too, with whole cities. We can train them to uh, understand what makes a city, particularly a European city, South American city, an Asian city, and it's able to place them geographically purely based on their form. Now, a lot of these themes like, uh, th these seem a bit like toy problems, perhaps, but I think this is actually going to be crucial to how we think about design in the future, especially when we're dealing with uncertainty. There's a couple of reasons for this, and they have to do with dominant trends in how computation has been used in the past. Uh, one of them is, is the BIM approach. So one of the ideals behind building information modeling, for instance, is that you have one model, and you have as much information data in that model as possible. And everyone can use that model to create the building. Now, that may work at some stages of the construction process. We know it does, but we know there are problems with that as well. And particularly when we're dealing with design, we know that different people, different members of the team, for different purposes, will have lots of different representations that they need to use to progress the design forward. The other side of things, for the, the sort of parametricists, um, we're very good, and we have been very good, say 10 years ago, with smart geometry. There's a lot of work in parametric design. What we've been historically very good at is coming up with a very simple set of rules in a parametric model and generating a lot of complexity from it. That's a very powerful tool, and it produces often very beautiful work, but it's not the whole side of the story. Particularly when we're trying to produce something that has uncertainties in it, that is very complex, we're not very good necessarily at evaluating that complexity. We can evaluate a few simple rules, but just because those rules are internally consistent doesn't mean they're the whole picture. It doesn't mean that they're going to produce a building or even a, a, if we're trying to produce something like a city, which is much more complex. It doesn't guarantee that it's going to be good. It may look complex, it may look like a real city, but it may be fundamentally flawed. So these are potential problems we have to deal with. Now, I'm not going to suggest we go back to designing with pencil and paper all the time, obviously, but there are other techniques of working. Now, this is, uh, you probably recognize, this is a laser scan. It's just a series, a point cloud, and uh, we're flying through it. What we're doing when we're looking at this is coming up with new representations in our heads. This is what thinking's about. We see, ah, there's a tank, there's a staircase. It's different all the time, and we're constantly making different representations of this. We don't form a standard boundary representation in our minds of the geometry and reduce the polygons so that we can use it over and over again. We just look at this and come up with representations on the fly. Now, a computer can do this as well. 
If a computer can do this, obviously it can do it with the same kinds of things that we can do it with, this visual processing that our brains have evolved for, but our brains haven't evolved to deal with other types of things that maybe computers can deal with. So this work by David Hawkins, for instance, energy consumption in buildings. We can train the computer to have an intuition about what energy consumption will be like and predict that based on uh, the design of the building. Now, we're not necessarily very good at that. I think that you asked a question of the audience earlier that uh, reflected on this. We're not very good necessarily at dealing with scales that are well beyond our body. So this is a space syntax analysis is now capable of, of looking at global scale analysis, understanding global social and economic phenomenon. The computer could potentially have intuitions about this that are very valuable. And finally, I said I'd get back to the Turing test, why it is actually important. It's important because the Turing test is not a standard scientific test. In science, what you usually have is a very simple hypothesis and an experiment to test that hypothesis. And it's all very clear. Now, science is simple, but design is not simple. Design is very complex. The way we deal with design is to take as many different points of view as possible, subject it to criticism from as many different points of view, as many different representations, and that's how we test it. What the Turing test does is not like a scientific experiment at all. It's like a design crit. That's why, if we're going to have truly intelligent machines, they're going to have to be intelligent by virtue of the kinds of things that we do. And, of course, if we do have them, they'll be very useful to us in the future. Thank you.